Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Brent. I uh, just want to thank you for tuning in uh, for this past Sunday's sermon. If you are watching on our app or through our website, or if you're listening through wherever you catch your podcasts, we're so happy that you're tuning in with us today. Uh, we just want to invite you uh, to take a couple minutes and fill out a Connect card, or if you want to give um, financially and partner with our ministry, right now is your opportunity to do that through the links below or the buttons below this video. Uh, we're going to start the sermon here in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to personally say thank you for tuning in. Thank you for partnering with us. We love you guys, and uh, we just pray that this message blesses you. We'll see you in a couple minutes. Lots of good stuff. Uh, I, we, we wanted the kids to come in. We're going to dismiss the kids. Give it up for the kids. That's right. Uh, this building, if not more so than our, like this building is just as much theirs, if not more. And uh, we want them to be a part of it. It was cool. Um, the, even the youngest kids had hammers yesterday and were like knocking down drywall and pulling stuff out. Uh, and it was just cool pulling up tax strips. Like they they've taken ownership, and it's it's really awesome to see. And uh, like two and a half years into this thing, we started this church two and a half years ago. I would have never thought in a million years that uh, we'd be renovating a building. And uh, I, this is not my sermon, but if you feel like there's a mountain in front of you and it's too big, like God can move it. God makes things happen that you didn't even see coming. Uh, I, I was talking to someone this week and I, I was like, I thought, I literally thought COVID was going to kill us. Like I came here on Sundays and was like, oh yeah, God's so good. But I, man, Monday through Saturday, I'm like, oh gosh, we're done. Like this is, I'd call Zach, I'd be like, we're, like, what do we do now? Like, we, like how, how's this work out? And, and now God's given us a home. And uh, it's so cool. So uh, make sure you're a part of that. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Like, you guys need to be more excited. Like, there's going to be, like, we're starting a youth ministry. Like, that was not on our radar, but it's happening. Like, if God's going to put us next to a high school, literally next to a high school, we're going to have a youth ministry. And uh, it's cool. So lots of good things happening. I discovered this week um, that, that our new church is a Pokemon Go hub or something. I don't even know what that means still, but lots of Pokemon people. Uh, I, I was, there was a guy parked, we were leaving one day after working all day and there was a guy parked in the back. And so I just drove by and asked him if he needed anything. And he said, I almost caught it. And I was like, huh? I'm like, what are you talking? He's like a 40 year old guy. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm playing Pokemon. I'm like, what? I'm so whatever, play Pokemon in the back of the parking lot. Just don't break anything. But, uh, it's awesome. We've gone through, we're on our third 20 yard dumpster. Uh, lot, and we hopefully won't need to buy another one, but we may. <laughs> so lots of cool things happening. Uh, if you can be a part of Saturdays, come out. It'll be fun. Uh, it might not be safe, but it'll be fun. <laughs> so <laughs> it's mostly safe. We, uh, we, you know, yeah, yeah, it's good. So anyway, I want to get into the message because I do want to talk about something for a few minutes today. If you have your Bibles, we are in the book of Nehemiah. And we started this series titled The Build Out, and it was where God was leading us into this year. 
And I, it's, it was not intentional, but it is uh, intentional in, in God's view that we're in this series titled The Build Out while we're literally in the middle of a build out and uh, watching what, what's happening at the church and, and everything that's going on. Um, but, but, but the prayer was, as we went into this series for 2021, um, I really felt God continuing to say, this is the rebuild, like, this is the building here. We are building, we, we're not going to stay lost in the rubble of what maybe the last year was or the expectations that were lost, but, but God is building and preparing something and he's preparing us as the church for what he wants to do, not just in 2021, but 2022, 2020, you know, with these young kids, like th these kids are going to grow up and go through our youth ministry and be a part of our church. And, and, and like, I, I think sometimes we look so one dimensional, like what's God doing right in front of me? And we miss the fact that he's preparing us for things that are like 10 years from now that you don't even understand. And that if even if someone told you, you'd laugh at them. It, like some of you can look back on your life and say, you, you look, you're in it now. But if someone told me where I was going to be right now, I would have laughed them out of the room, right? And, uh, and, and so God is preparing us and he's building something within us. So as we're in this series, the build out, we've been going through the book of Nehemiah. And we started uh, in Nehemiah's rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem after they've been exiled to Babylon. And as we get to Nehemiah 8, which is where we're going to be today, the wall is finally done. And next week, Zach's going to come and he's going to bring a really good word. I'm excited about it, about the process of them finishing the wall and what that looked like. And, and uh, he was all amped up about it. So I'm like, come on, come preach. So uh, it's going to be good. Zach always gives me a little bit of a panic attack when he preaches, but it's good. It's good stuff. So. Uh, but, but we're in this series, they've, they've been rebuilding the wall, and the wall is finally done when we get to Nehemiah 8. The work had been done, it had been rebuilt, all the gates had been re rebuilt, but so the physical work had been completed. But I think when, when we're thinking of that one-dimensional, what's right in front of us, a lot of the times we think like the physical's done, but what we don't realize is that's when the mental battle usually begins. If you've ever been through a sports injury, anybody, anybody ever hurt themselves playing sports? Anyone? Or you just hurt yourself in general? Uh, maybe you're just accident prone. But if you've ever been through a sports injury, the hardest part isn't rehabbing during the injury. The hardest part is after. I've blown my MCL twice. And the first time was a cool story playing football. The second time was a stupid story on a slip and slide in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, but it was funny. And uh, if it's funny, it's worth it. But uh, let me tell you, if, if you've ever had a knee injury, you've hurt yourself, or if you've ever seen an athlete, um, Alex Smith, right? No one thought he'd even walk again, and he played football this year. He started for the, I almost called them the Redskins, whatever their name is, the Washington football team. And, uh, but if you've ever seen someone rehab an injury, when, when you get out and begin to use that joint or that part of your body again, the mental battle you go through is sometimes even harder than the physical. I remember after the second time I blew my knee out, uh, I, I tried to go to the gym and I would try to work out, and I was terrified to do anything. I was, the doctor was telling me, you're physically okay, but any time I would move, even now, and, and this was years and years and years ago, even now when I do things, I get nervous because there's a fear of what could happen, right? And I think sometimes we get lost in that, what could happen in this injury? What could happen in our life? And we get lost in this mental battle. And this is exactly where the people of God find themselves. They've come back to Jerusalem. God told them to rebuild their homes so they make stick forts, basically. Literally, that's what it says. They make their homes and they've rebuilt this wall to protect themselves. And, and the physical is done, but the mental battle is still happening. So if you have your Bible, Nehemiah 8. I am not going to read the whole entire thing, but I am going to jump around a little bit. So just hang with me because I'll be here forever if I read it all because I can't get through three sentences without stopping and telling a story. Let's just be honest. So Nehemiah 8, and it says that they're giving all these dates and these times. It says the Israelites were settled in their towns, so they're within the, 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 the wall. They're in their city. And it says, all the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square, just inside the water gate. Essentially, they're having church service. 
All of God's people had gathered together. They've come to the place. And so God says, I'm going to send the priest Ezra because you people still need to remember who I am. And so Ezra comes up. Ezra the priest comes. And it says he faced the square in verse 3. See, I, I got to give you the verses if I'm going to hop around or you're going to be totally lost. In verse 3 it says, he faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon. Some of y'all think I preach long. Come on, they started at like early morning. I think like 6 a.m. until noon. Some of y'all wouldn't, you'd be, I'm out. Like, get me my breakfast. Like, you're, you're not, you can't last a half hour. I preach 40 minutes and you're like, oh, Brent, you talked so long. Oh. They're sitting, man, there's no worship band. John up here in skinny jeans looking pretty, calling, singing. They're just listening to Ezra read the law. Come on, you guys are so posh in your American church, you know. So they're standing in the, I'm sorry, they're standing in the gates and Ezra gathers them together. In verse three, it says he faced the square early morning until noon and he read aloud to everyone who could understand. All of the people listened closely to the book of the law. Essentially, Ezra's reading the first like four books of the Old Testament, the scrolls. He's just rocking some scrolls, pulling them out, and just reading to everyone. Talk about imagine if when he gets to Leviticus, right? And he's reading like the genealogy. And could you imagine being like an eight-year-old and you're standing outside in the hotness? And Ezra's up there looking all holy, reading a bunch of names. You're like, Come on, can I go play with a pile of rocks? Can I do something? But he's reading the law. And it says as he's reading and they're having this church service. Verse 6, it says, Ezra began to praise the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, right? He gets them all hyped up about the law. He's a good preacher, right? If you can preach the book of the law and everyone starts chanting for like, Six hours? You're a good preacher. This is like Stephen Furtick in Bible times. And uh, so he's, he's praising the Lord, and they all begin to chant, amen, amen. Come on, some of y'all need to take some notes from the old Jewish people. Some of y'all need to talk more during church. They're chanting, amen. They lifted up their hands, and they bow down and worship the Lord with their face on the ground. So Ezra comes forward and he begins to preach this sermon and he's, he's reading the law. Essentially, he's just reading. The power of the scripture comes over the group and they begin to chant and praise God. And they bow down and begin to worship. But then something interesting happens in the midst of that. So, so the, if you read Nehemiah, they go through all these like kind of fluff stuff in verse 7. But then they get to verse 9. And something shifts in the midst of this service, sermon. Everyone's praising the Lord, but then Nehemiah or Ezra begins to condemn the people. He says, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. For today is a sacred day before the Lord our God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So, so you, I want you to catch it because this is so important. I, I believe this is going to be transformational for your life. That they're worshiping God. They're saying, praise God. Pray, amen, amen, amen. And all of a sudden they just begin to start crying. Like it turns into happy chanting to weeping all over. Some of you are like, that's just a normal Pentecostal service. I don't know what the big deal is. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And they're all, everyone's, ah! <laughs> they begin to weep. And so Ezra stops him and he says, stop this. Like, like, like you, you guys got to quit weeping. See, they're not weeping because they're overcome with God's goodness. They're weeping out of their despair. And there is a big difference. There, there is a difference between weeping as you're praising God and weeping out of your dis despair. In verse 10, it says, Nehemiah then comes forward. Because you know when Nehemiah steps forward, everyone's going to listen. Ezra, Ezra he, he, he says, stop, stop, stop. Nehemiah comes forward and he, he affirms the words of the priest. He says, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. 
and share gifts of food with the people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. He goes on and says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites then spoke up and they began to say, hush, don't weep, for this is a sacred day. Now, why, what, what is, you're like, what does this mean, Brent? Like, what are you, where are you going with this? There, there, there's a purpose to this passage. And, and, and I think for many of us, we would move right past this verse and say, okay, they had a good church service. Let's move on to some good stuff. And, but, but I believe there's a powerful encouragement uh, to us today, especially right now. See, the, the, everyone thinks the wall's done, and, 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 and even as we read this, we're like, the wall's done, the work's completed, let's move on with the mission, let's, let's rebuild the temple, and let's rebuild all these things. And instead, everyone assembles together for this moment, and, and as they begin to worship, they begin to weep, because they're thinking one-dimensionally of their situation. See, they're not weeping because they love God. They begin to weep because they think of what brought them to this moment. Remember, the people had been exiled to Babylon. Why were they exiled? Because they disobeyed God. They turned their back on the Father. And so when they begin to weep, they're, they're weeping out of shame, saying, look what I've done, look what we've done. We're just going to screw up again, right? Right? And so when Ezra condemns them, he says, you're not weeping out of, out of a heart of gratitude or joy. You're weeping out of shame. And I think so often as people, we fall victim to the curse of shame in our lives. See, shame will always hold you back. And so often, when, when we walk through moments of shame, it's like a knee injury. God is saying, get up and begin to move that thing. But you're so scared that you're going to screw up that you say, I'd rather just sit in this place. I'd rather just sit in my failure. I want to I wanna feel, you ever seen it? I just want to feel sorry for myself. Just leave me alone and let me be emotional right now. Don't even act like you haven't done it before because everybody's done it before. <laughs> I'm just having a day. Let me have my day and let me, you know, I'll move on. We love to sit in our failure. We love to sit in our self-pity, our, 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 our brokenness. But, but what we can learn about the nature of God in the scriptures is that God is always working for the new. See, the gospel, when it transforms your life, it's not anymore about the past. It's about the new thing that God is doing in you and through you. And so as they're sitting in this, what is still the rubble of Jerusalem, they got the wall done in their huts, but it's still very much destroyed. They aren't looking to what God is about to do. They're so focused on their failure. They're missing this moment. They're missing the power of what's happening. The fact that they are worshiping within their city again. Why? Because they're too stuck in the failure that they don't see the new thing God is doing. They have that Solomon moment, right? If you ever feel bad about yourself, read Ecclesiastes. Some of y'all know it's a depressing book of the Bible. <laughs> Solomon was having a bad day and wrote it out. See, see, they, they take the posture of Solomon where he says, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is a failure and a waste. But it's interesting. I've seen people take that and, and, and kind of bend that. But if you read the words of Isaiah, right? A book of Isaiah points to Jesus constantly. Isaiah 43, 19 says, I'm doing a new thing. Now that it springs up, do you perceive it? See, God is always doing something new. And so often we want to grab hold of, of the past or our brokenness of our failure that we find ourselves missing the new thing that's taking place. Even in the house of God. I heard a pastor this week talking about uh, this last year in covid and he said, you know, he said, I believe that the local church is going through a, a, uh, an ice age. 
The local church this last year has been going through uh, a modern ice age, and and what's really sad is the dinosaurs aren't going to survive. Now, that's a harsh statement to make. But what he's saying is if you're so held tight to the past, if you can't change your direction, your position where God is calling you, you're going to miss the moment. And so when Nehemiah comes forward, he's not trying to shame them, make them feel bad. He's saying, stop, you're miss, You're going to miss what God wants to do if you don't get up and celebrate. He's like, go eat. Like, let's end church right now. He's like, let's, you guys, some of y'all looked up like, oh, we're ending church right now? Let's go. <laughs> All right, come on. <laughs> Some, maybe you do. Maybe you need to go and just celebrate right now. But, but what he's saying, he's saying, we need to stop. We need to get out of here. I know we're having a God moment. We're chanting amen. But let's go. We need to go and have a party. Because look what God has done on this pile of rubble, on this, on this brokenness that's going. Nehemiah and Ezra are watching the people standing on what the past of their failure, and they're saying, get up and do a new thing. See, the gospel will always pull you out of that. The gospel, when Jesus came and he died on the cross and he rose again three days later, it wasn't just a feel-good story to shock and wow us, right? Like, oh, magic. What he was doing is saying, I'm going to come down, I'm going to lift you out of what you can't lift yourself out of, and I'm going to set you apart. I'm going to put you on a new path. I'm going to give you new garments. I'm going, to, I'm going to put my seal of approval on your life because I'm ready to do a new thing. It's the words of Isaiah. And God's standing there saying, do you see it? Or are you too focused on the past? Are you still seeing things through old eyes? Anybody hate vegetables as a kid? Come on, I hated vegetables as a kid. Man, y'all are so holy and perfect around here. You guys are like, we loved vegetables our whole lives. And we, come on, you guys just sit there and stare at me. Y'all are liars in church. So every kid hated vegetables. Don't even play. I remember sitting at the table. My mom was mean. She was like, you're going to sit here all night till you eat those green beans. And out of protest, I was like, fine, I'll sit here all night. And me and my, my stepsister, Katie, literally sat on opposite side of the table, and we just stared at each other with our arms crossed. And, you know, we sat there until it was bedtime, and then my mom said, you can take your green beans up to your room. <laughs> Let me tell you, I learned how to hide green beans in a napkin that night, acting like I was coughing. <clears throat> like, I chewed them up. I already did the bad part. I might as well have just swallowed them. I spit that mess into a napkin. But let me tell you, I, I did not like vegetables growing up. But let me, as I grew older, I found out there were things that I thought I didn't like. I was looking at them through my old eyes. I love broccoli. Anybody love broccoli? Get me some, man, sauteed in a pan with some olive oil. Woo, get rid of all the healthy stuff. It's like eating potato chips. I will eat a whole plate of broccoli now. Man, as a kid, I would have not, you could have brought broccoli into my zone. I would have never found the joy of eating broccoli. Some of you are like, this is weird. But I, I literally love broccoli. But if I would have constantly looked at broccoli through my old lens, I would have never found the joy in broccoli as an adult. Some of you are like, you're weird. It's healthy for you. It's good. It's good protein. Why? why? I'm joking, but I'm serious. I think sometimes we look at the things of God and our walk with God through an old lens like looking at vegetables. And God's saying, I have something good for your life. I have something that will enrich you and bring you power and bring you worth if you would just quit looking at my presence through an old lens. This is why when you read the gospel, Jesus sought out those that were the least of these, as the Bible says. He sat with prostitutes and tax collectors because the world looked at these people and said there's nothing useful with their life. And Jesus said there's everything useful with their life. That's why Jesus looked at your life. And whether you realize it or not, you say there's nothing good that can come from my life. And Jesus says there's everything that can come from your life. 
because God is always doing something new. But so often we find ourselves rejecting the call of God. My question is, are there things in your life that you're sacrificing the blessing that God has for you today because you can't release the past? Jerusalem is sacrificing the blessing of God bringing them back to their city. They begin to weep and cry out in shame saying, where is God? Band, if you want to get up here. They begin to, they begin, they're missing the moment that's happening. So Nehemiah has to get up and say, stop, end this whole thing. Because God wants us to be joyful. We need to celebrate. That's why he goes on and he says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can get through this. You are released from the past. God doesn't want us to think about being in Babylon. God doesn't want to think about our city being destroyed. God doesn't want to think about your fail. God wants to look to your future because there is a new thing dwelling within you. There is a favor on your life. And there are some of you in this room that have walked through some things. Some of it's self-inflicted. Some of it's been brought upon you by the outside that was out of your control. But you've walked through things and you are literally sacrificing the blessing God has for your life because you can't let go of the past. And so you, you, you're like that kid with his arms crossed at the table. I'm not eating green beans. God's saying, if you pick up a green bean, it's about to change your life. Some of y'all are sitting right now. And even as we're talking about this new building, and Zach's saying, we got to give to the building. I'm going to give this. If you know me, you, don't, you know I don't like to go here. But, but some of y'all are hearing me talk about, we're talking about this new building and say, we got to give to this. We got to build this. It's for the future. It's for the young people. And you're like, you know what? I was at a church and all they talked about was money and they burned me and the pastor went out to eat at fancy restaurants and he had a private jet and all the, I don't know, maybe that's true, but, but they did all this stuff and I'm not not giving nothing. I'm not saying this to get your money. I'm saying you are going to miss the joy of being a part of what God is doing because you can't release the baggage. This is where God's people find themselves. And so when Nehemiah stands up in verse 10 and he says, go and celebrate. This is a sacred day. He's literally saying, lay your burdens down. Lay your burdens at the altar. Lay your burdens in the middle of this rubble and go walk in the joy of his presence. Some of y'all came in here with a yoke around your neck. And you wonder why, man, God, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, but I can't find joy in your presence. I, I can't let go. Some of y'all have walked through some things and I know it because I've heard your stories and some of it's unfair and you've been beat up and you've been dragged down and, and you've been burned by the church. Let me tell you something, the church is messy because we are messy. It's not God. Some of y'all have trust issues and, and faith issues and you're walking. I, I literally sat with my counselor this week because I was like, the, the weight of the world is too much and, and I just need to meet with him and he needs to help me. He's a Christian guy, godly man. We literally didn't even talk about mental stuff. We just talked about the, the word of God for like an hour and it was awesome. But there was one point in the meeting where I was saying, Jeff, I don't, know, I don't know how to get through this. I don't, I don't know how to feel better. And he said, all right, we need to stop. Literally like Nehemiah. We need to stop what we're doing. You need to do something right now. And so I was sitting there. We're, and this is through video screen. Like we're not even in the same room. Talk about awkward. But like... 
I'm, I tell you this story because God is ready to move in your life. He said, I want you to take your hands and I want you to hold them out in this posture. And he said, do you feel like there's a yoke around you? Do you feel like there's a millstone? What do, what do you feel like is around you? And I said, I just feel like there's a millstone that I can't get rid of. This wasn't in my notes, by the way. I was going to go a completely different direction. And I'm sitting there and I said, I feel like there's a millstone and I just need it released because I know God wants to take me into the new, but I need to release this. And he says, okay, I want you to close your eyes. And he says, I know it sounds weird. And I know it's going to, I know it's going to feel uncomfortable. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to literally imagine you're walking before Jesus with that millstone. And he says, I want, you to, I want you to take it and you're in his presence and he says, what is he telling you to do with it? He says, it can be anything. Maybe it just poof, disappears, whatever. And, 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 and I told him, I said, I feel like, I, I start crying like through video. And I says, I think he's just telling me to let it go. Why? Because... Someone else didn't throw it around my neck. I was the one holding on to it around my neck. Jesus has given me every reason, every way to let it go. And I had to literally release it so that I could move forward where he was calling me. Why do I tell you that story? Because some of you can't find freedom because you won't let go. This morning is your opportunity to step into what God has for you, to step in where he's taking our church, where he's taking your life, where he wants to take your family. And some of y'all have been carrying around things since childhood around your neck. And it's not God putting it there. It's not that person that wounded you putting it there. It's you holding it there. And God is saying, come before me and let it go. Go and celebrate. Because being in God's presence should be fun. This is where the church has gotten it wrong. We think like, oh, it's gonna be stuffy and stuff. No, man, God should be fun. We should be laughing. We should be goofing around. John should be swinging from a chandelier in the middle of it. That's sacrilegious. Whatever. Like, it was funny. <laughs> it should be fun to be in God's presence. And God wants to take you into that place of freedom. But some of y'all this morning need to do exactly what I did over FaceTime the other day. So if everyone stand up. If you're not feeling this right now, and it, it, I promise you at some point, this message will be relevant to your life. But some of you, you are not here by accident today. There are wounds in your heart that you need to let go. It might be from a family member. It might be from a pastor. It might be from a friend. It might be over your finances. It might be over your children. Whatever it is, there, is, there are things around you. And, and, and right now, everybody with their eyes closed. If that's you, I just want you to lift up your, reach out your hands. If there's something that you got to release, just put your hands out. And I want you to imagine you are, you are literally right now in this room, not, not because I'm saying it, you are walking before the presence of Jesus. And whatever that burden is, whether it's, a, whether it's a boulder or a millstone or a yoke, whatever is hanging over you, He's standing there ready to take it. This is what the Bible says. This is scriptural. Whatever you need to release, whatever you need to lay at his feet, he is ready to receive it. And as you stand in his presence, 
Whatever it is you need to do to that thing that has been holding you back, that has been keeping you from the joy of his presence, that is holding you back from the new, I want you to do it. If you need to throw it, if you need to blow it up, if it needs to disappear, if you need to let go of it, whatever you need to do, I want you to put it at Jesus' feet right now. Just begin to release it. The Bible says his burden is light. Jesus has already paid the price for whatever that is. Just begin to release it at his feet. God, right now, God, I pray that we would just release. God, that we would have a Nehemiah moment where, 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 where you're calling us to let go and step forward, to release the brokenness, the bondage, the hurt, the wounds that are holding us back so that we can step into the new, so that we can walk in joy, so that we can celebrate the new thing that is happening around us. We aren't held captive to 2020. We aren't held captive to our past relationships. We aren't held captive to the wounds of loved ones, to the wounds of spirit spiritual leaders. We aren't held captive to the things that have hurt us, but God, we find freedom in your presence. We find freedom at the feet of Jesus. And so God, I pray things would be released. Freedom would be found. Joy would be restored. That we would walk in boldness. That we would walk in freedom. That we would walk in joy. That we would celebrate the fruit of who you are. We would celebrate the glory of who you are. And God, we would step into the new, the new thing that you are doing. It is springing up around us. In Jesus' name, amen.